Hello all, welcome to yet another week in our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. Uh, I hope you have been enjoying um, the journey with me uh, for the first week and we hope to make uh, this week even more exciting. So we will delve into deeper details on uh, what, uh, you know, what goes behind in doing adaptive control. Uh, we of course start this week again by looking at this uh, very nice representative image which is that of a, a rover on mars and uh, the hope as always is that we can develop algorithms that will drive systems that such as these uh, for autonomous motion so this is shrikant sukumar from systems and control iit bombay so without delaying any further let me go into our lectures so um, in fact before i move forward into the lectures for this week uh, a quick recap of what we sort of saw last time okay that is in the last week we uh, sort of uh, spent our time last week in uh, trying to develop a lot of the structure that is required to uh, study adaptive control or nonlinear control for that matter yeah so what is this structure uh, this is structure such as um, norms, vector spaces, inner products, induced norms, supremums, and things like that. Okay, uh, and notions of convergence and so on and so forth. Okay, so so this is the idea, right? So this is the idea. So this is what we have been uh, studying about in the last week. In this week, we uh, sort of go into a little bit more detail, right, of the mathematics that is, uh, you know, prevalent in adaptive control. And the title of the week's lectures are uh, basically Barbalat's Lemma, right? So this is a rather uh, important uh, tool that we will learn today. And we will also, uh, well, we will learn this week. And we will also see by the end of the week how uh, this powerful tool um, can be used to analyze convergence in adaptive control. Okay, so without um, sort of delaying any further, I will go into what these important lemmas are uh, today. Right. So let's see. So uh, we have a few different. Um, sort of preliminary results that are required uh, before we can even you know, go into talking about uh, things like the Papalat slam. Right? That's really the idea here. So what are these um, sort of preliminary lemmas? So the first one is um, this lemma 1.1, which says that if there is a scalar valued function, so by a scalar valued function, we mean a function which takes a real number and outputs another real number okay so the only property that we have specified for this function is that it takes in a real number and outputs another real number usually uh, for us this real number that is input is the time okay and more often than not now suppose we have some additional properties on this function f yeah what are these additional properties that f is bounded from below and f is non increasing okay what does it mean for a function to be bounded from below it means so bounded from below if i look at this property what does it mean for a function to be bounded from below it means that the function f of t is greater than or equal to some uh, constant let me denote it by f under bar okay for all time greater than zero okay so for all time greater than zero f of t is lower bounded by an f under bar okay there has to exist such a f under bar all right and further 
it is non-increasing so what does it mean for a function so notice that we have not said anything about the differentiability of f and so on and so forth usually whenever we talk about uh, non-increasing uh, the first thing that pops into your mind is to take the derivative and see if it is decreasing or something like that all right but please do not uh, you know sort of uh, lean into that temptation because we are not saying anything about the differentiability of f or even the continuity of f okay so suppose i what so but the notion of non increasing can still be defined yeah without requirement for continuity and so on so suppose i have a plot of this function that looks like this so it's non increasing so say it uh well sorry since it's not increasing it can never increase it can either stay constant or dip okay. so if you look at this so this is the sort of vertical axis so the function i have actually shown you is not even a continuous function right why is it not a continuous function because if you look at this piece and this piece right here there is a distinct jump all right therefore this is not a continuous function yeah however it is still a non increasing function right because its value either stays constant or goes down okay it never actually increases okay so this f of t is a non increasing function so if these two conditions are satisfied that is if it has a lower bound right so what is this lower bound say this lower bound can be represented by say something like this yeah so say this is the lower bound f under bar and further it is non increasing something like this then f of t has a limit as t goes to infinity the f of t has a finite limit as t goes to infinity okay so from this picture itself it should somehow um, sort of give you some indicator as to what this finite limit is going to be however this is uh, left as an exercise so this result is found in the book by ianu and so adaptive control all right so i encourage you to look at the proof and actually see what is this finite limit okay what do you think this finite limit is going to be so one thing is for sure right we've already seen the notion of a supremum i encourage you to look at the notion of an infimum simply the opposite notion so if a function has a lower bound if a function has a lower bound that is it is bounded below it means that the function definitely has an infimum okay so you can sort of see that it's sort of going towards the lower bound the lower bound may not necessarily be the infimum we have already seen examples of this right i mean if you take for example a set of the form uh for example if i take a set of the form uh 0 comma 1 okay the infimum of this set is 0 just like the supremum is 1 we already saw an example of this all right but if i look at a lower bound then minus 1 minus 2 etc etc are all lower bounds okay these are all lower bounds all right therefore infimum is not necessarily the lower bound okay however it is so it's an important distinction just like supremum is not the upper bound but the least upper bound similarly the infimum is not the lower bound but the greatest lower bound right 
So I want you to look at what this finite limit is going to be. Yeah. And this picture is a pretty good indicator of what's going to happen. But the important thing to remember for us is that we have a fun scalar function which is lower bounded and non increasing. Then it has a finite limit as t goes to infinity. All right. Great. The second lemma is that if a function, a scalar valued function, again, same is such that the derivative is l infinity that is the derivative is bounded remember l infinity norm in existence essentially implies boundedness we already saw this in the last week yeah At the end of the last week we saw that l infinity norm existence implies boundedness of the signal all right so right, for moving forward i'm going to label this as uh, week two lecture one all right sorry i didn't do that earlier all right so if we have a scalar valued function such that its derivative is bounded l infinity and bounded are identical notions then the function f is uniformly continuous okay very very important very very important and we we regularly use uh, this notion of uniform continuity okay we will regularly use the notion of uniform continuity okay we have not spoken about this in this course however it is expected that you will know what is continuity and what is uniform continuity in fact this is the given as an exercise yeah that you need to define uniform continuity so uniform continuity is a rather uh, special uh, version of continuity itself yeah continuity means that there are no gaps just you know very very um, you know vaguely speaking yeah of course you have very specific epsilon delta proofs uh, epsilon delta definitions which say that continuity sort of implies that for a small value in the argument the function value does not have very dramatic changes yeah, that's what it means for a function to be continuous uniform continuity is a further specialization of this notion okay it means that the continuity is not affected by time that is the argument itself okay but i encourage you to look at this definition i encourage you to write up this definition i encourage you to understand this definition because we will be regularly using this okay we'll be regularly using it all right so we are saying that if a scalar valued function is such that its derivative is bounded then the function is uniformly continuous all right great so of course uh, it should be evident to you that if a derivative is bounded it means that f is at least a c1 function that is once continuously differentiable because otherwise i cannot even speak of the notion of f dot yeah so because i have uh, used f dot it means that f is c1 okay so this is a bigger assumption than what we had in 1.1 in in lemma 1.1 i didn't even have to assume continuity but in lemma 1.2 i am assuming that the function is differentiable okay all right great now let's let's sort of look at an example although we have seen this example uh, even in the last week but i repeat it yeah if i have a uh, vector valued function x of t defined by sine t and cosine t then the two norm is simply equal to one yeah i'm not actually showing the computation i mean this is fine i mean i can just simply write it out uh, we have done this in the last lecture of the previous week yeah and so i'm not really going into too much detail so the vector norm is one therefore the infinity norm which is simply the supremum of the vector norm right so this is just soup over t uh, norm t yeah that's just one because the supremum over all time of a constant is the same constant okay? because the time argument doesn't really show up in the argument here there's no time argument here because this is just one all right 
all right so this is a, of course i mean we know all this that any vector norm could have been used and so on but we choose the two vector norm simply because it's easy to compute it gives me a very nice simple result okay great uh, then we move on to the key lemma okay then we move on to the very very key lemma which is the babalat's lemma so before we move on to this lemma again i hope you have uh, sort of um, you have to um, sort of commit to your mind these two lemmas that is lemmas 1.1 and 1.2 okay that is whenever i have a scalar valued function which is non increasing and lower bounded it's bound to have a finite limit as t goes to infinity okay and whenever a scalar function has a bounded derivative then it is uniformly continuous okay so i mean we can look at very simple examples notice that this is a sufficiency condition it doesn't say that if the function is uniformly continuous then the derivative is bounded nothing like that it just says that if the derivative is bounded then the function is uniformly continuous all right so so let's see some you know basic examples so let's see okay so if i take a function f of t as sine t yeah and then i compute f dot of t it's cosine t and this is of course a bounded function yeah what does it imply it implies that f of t is uniformly continuous okay on the other hand if you look at something like f of t is t squared yeah and f dot of t is then y is t this is not bounded yeah because this goes to infinity as t goes to infinity therefore this is not a bounded function for all time of course for some window of time it is but not for all time so this implies that yeah f is possibly not uniformly continuous yeah i say possibly i use the word possibly why because the converse is not really part of the claim right so if f is f dot is bounded then uniform continuity is guaranteed but if f dot is not bounded doesn't mean that f is not uniformly continuous it could still be in this case you will see that it is not uniformly continuous it is not very difficult to verify right in this case it's possible to verify that it is in fact not uniformly continuous however that cannot be claimed in general so <clears throat> this result only says that f of t equals t square is possibly not uniformly continuous okay we cannot guarantee that it's uniformly continuous okay great right. so uh, so once you have these two lemmas committed can okay, be which sort of give you uh, the first one gives you something on convergence of certain special functions and the second one tells you something about uniform continuity of certain functions we can move on to the babalat's lemma okay so the babalat's lemma is is a sort of very simple looking but quite an amazing result because the advent of this result is what uh, made analysis in adaptive control possible before this result came up uh, folks knew about lyapunov analysis we we have not yet studied lyapunov analysis but folks knew about lyapunov analysis since the 1800s the advent of lyapunov right uh, but when, as soon as adaptive control designs came into play and you will see later on in some examples that uh, it was not possible to analyze convergence of adaptive systems using just uh, lyapunov methods yeah and so everybody was stuck an algorithm was found it seemed to be working fine in examples however there was no way to prove convergence yeah and okay so, and you should understand what these words mean by now yeah so 
uh, Bablat's lemma is what enabled uh, the adaptive control as a field to move ahead and adaptive control uh, evolved only because of the advent of Bablat's lemma, I might say. Okay, so what is this Bablat's lemma? Very celebrated, but very simple in its statement. Yeah, Bablat's lemma essentially, like I said, because it helps with convergence analysis, you can imagine it is a convergence result. Okay, Bablat's lemma is essentially a convergence result, and we are going to very carefully look at what this is. Okay. So the Bablat's lemma integral form, like it says here, but this is what we call the original Bablat's lemma, says that if I have a function f which takes scalar inputs and and outputs a vector or a scalar, anything is possible. Okay, no problem. N can be one, two, three, anything. Yeah. So scalar input, typically time again. Yeah, we are always talking about time as an argument here because we're talking about convergence in time. Yeah, as time goes to infinity, good things happen or signals go to zero. That's really what we want to prove again and again in this course, or for that matter, in most nonlinear systems course. Yeah. Uh, so if we consider a function, which is taking a scalar input time and gives out a vector. Yeah. Such so that the signal is integrable. Okay, so what does it mean uh, for a signal to be integrable? It means that integral from 0 to t f sigma d sigma with limit as t going to infinity exists and is finite. Okay, so this is what it means for a function to be integrable. So somehow uh, there is a definition inside the lemma. Okay. There's a definition inside the lemma, and what does the definition say? That a function is integrable if limit as t goes to infinity, zero to t f sigma d sigma exists and is finite. All right. So this is what is a function to be integrable. So as you can see, this is um, uh, integrability is an interesting property. It's not. Uh, uh, it's somehow connected to your L one norm. If you think about it, yeah, if you think about it, this is somehow connected to your L1 norm, but I'm not taking any norm here. Yeah, this is there's no norm here, it's just f sigma d sigma. So I'm integrating component wise. Yeah, but it looks like an L1. Yeah, you, when do you when do I say that a signal is L1? I say a signal is L1, so x is in L1 if integral uh, 0 to infinity um, norm of x t dt is less than infinity this is the notation that is it exists and is finite yeah, so so looks very similar right these look very similar okay right not exactly the same but similar all right so the first condition on this function on this function that takes time as an argument gives out a vector is that it is integrable and the second condition is that f is uniformly continuous so remember we already talked about uniform <coughs> Continuity here. Okay. So it's already showing up in Bablat's lemma. So if a function is integrable and it's uniformly continuous, then it it converges to zero as t goes to infinity. Yeah. Right? Rather powerful result. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a rather powerful result. So um, you know, this is um Let's see. Yeah, this is a rather powerful result. In order to uh, sort of indicate to you uh, how strong this result is, um, I will try to construct an example which has only one of these properties and not the other one. And then we see that it converges, what happens to the function, what happens to the convergence of the function. All right. So suppose I have to make this picture very carefully. So I draw the axes like this. So again, this is f of t and the x-axis is time. Yeah. So this is zero. Now I have to make markings. So this is say one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. I mean, yeah, we move on like that. Right. And then um 
and make these axes very carefully. So I'm carefully constructing this very neat looking function. Yeah, I'm carefully constructing this very neat looking function. Um, let's see. And I want to make it so that it's integrable. So that's the idea. I'm trying to make it into an integrable function. So how am I doing this? So at this argument one, I keep my, let's see, which way am I going? Uh, which way am I going? Am I making it taller? Uh, am I making it taller? Yeah, let's let's try this. Let's try this. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try something. All right, let me give this a shot. So at time one, the height is one, right? And the width is say uh, whatever. I mean, is also one, right? So. like this right so the width is also one yeah so similarly when this is say h yeah h is an integer and the height is so this is height is h Yeah, so this is sort of denoting h and the width is 1 by h. I know this picture is not very representative. Let's see, let's see. Let me try to make it representative. Yeah, so this width yeah, is 1 by h all right so what is the now if i look at the area of each of these so if i try to integrate this function from zero to infinity it is really the sum of these areas right so if if you try to do this right if i try to do this um integral from zero to infinity f t d t is actually equal to summation from h equal to 1 to infinity um, and area of this so half times base time height so let's see if I got this right. Mm -hmm. So I don't want it one by h, but I'm taking it as one by h cubed, if you may. Yeah. The very specific reason, right? So this is one by h cubed. Yeah. So what do I get here? I get summation h equal to 1 to infinity 1 over twice h squared. Okay. And this, uh, as a lot of you would know, is as a finite sum okay this is a finite sum okay so excellent so what have i just shown i have just shown that this function ft is actually integrable right right so what have i just shown i have shown that this function is integrable 
Okay, but what can I say about its limit as t goes to infinity? Anyone? What is going to be the limit as t goes to infinity? It's amazing. The function has no limit as t goes to infinity. Right? Because you're probably lying inside one of these um, triangles. Right? You're lying inside one of these very, very long thin triangles of really very very tall and very very thin triangles and so therefore there is no limit in fact yeah so why because this function is not uniformly continuous yeah so it's not easy to not difficult to actually verify that it is not uniformly continuous yeah and so both these assumptions of Babla's lemma are actually very tight assumptions right it seems like it's only a sufficient condition one way result but these are pretty tight requirements yeah if one of them is doesn't hold true then you no longer have convergence as t goes to infinity okay great so so what have we seen today we essentially talked about a couple of important lemmas right, um, on convergence and of course uniform continuity and then we looked at one of the most critical lemmas in adaptive control that is the Babalat's lemma yeah so we will look at a corollary of this next time and then try to see how this lemma can be put to use all right we'll stop here thank you